we are discussing winds and atmospheric movements and circulations. Uh, as an element of weather and climate, winds is not only the cause for phenomena like rainfall, uh, phenomena like cyclones, but it itself is also the consequence of other elements like temperature and insulation patterns. So integral to understanding weather and climate is to understand why we have winds, how does air move and what are the factors responsible. That's how I have uh, called this discussion as discussing the forces influencing winds and air circulation. Now, there are three fundamental forces that act to create winds and to modify winds. The pressure gradient force, which is essentially the difference of the pressure. Some area has more air, as in more pressure. Another area has lesser air, so lesser pressure. The difference between the two is called as the pressure gradient force. Uh, it's also referred to as barometric slope force. The slope because of the difference of the barometric readings. And the pressure gradient force is the primary wind generating force. There are factors that create winds and there are factors that modify winds. So of the three factors or the three forces rather that act on the winds, the main reason why the winds generate is because of the pressure gradient force. In short, you will find many books write this as the PGF, the pressure gradient force. Now, if I look at this okay, perspective depiction of an atmosphere with a surface, with the upper tropospheric layers and a vertical height, whatever movements we have is because of difference of pressure. So, on the surface, if this H is the high pressure and this L is the low pressure, wind will move from high towards low. If this is the high pressure and if this is the low pressure, the winds will move from high towards the low. Now, the air piling up here okay, can create more air here. The air moving like this, this creates a kind of a partial vacuum. So if I compare the pressure in the vertical direction, then relatively this with more air has relative high pressure with this with lesser air which has low pressure. A lot of students have a problem that air, I mean they remember this mechanically as air always moves from high towards low. That's right. Air moves from high towards low moves from high towards low, but in the vertical direction, the air seems to move from low towards high. The problem is you are comparing two different layers and not understanding the mechanism. When I say this is low, this is low in comparison to this high. This low is not comparable to this one. This is high comparable to this low. But when air piles up here and when air gets removed here, if I look in the vertical plane, effectively, this has relatively more high pressure than this one. So, if I remove this circle, then it looks like air is moving from low towards the high. Okay, so, please understand, don't mechanically by heart the symbols. And that's where students are a bit confused. So, as a rule, air always moves from high towards the low pressure. So, this is a surface wind. This is the upper tropospheric wind and this is called as air currents. Okay. But then the movement from high towards low is not as easy. Why? Because you also have the gravity acting. So there is a hydrostatic compensation or a balance that does not allow for regular air under normal circumstances to rise up the height. So, this is a kind of depiction of what the atmosphere is and how the air moves because of the pressure gradient force or the PGF. Now, there are two other forces which modify the winds. One is friction. Friction has the role of slowing down the winds and if there are obstructions high enough, the winds can also get diverted. That also you may look as the effect of friction. Think of a mountain 
and the wind rising up the mountain that's because of the mountain obstructing the course of the wind i could have some highlands and the winds can bifurcate that also is an example of some obstruction that diverts or modifies the winds so friction modifies both the velocity and also the direction the third one is the coriolis force now this is an interesting one coriolis force is an apparent force i think uh, those who are watching this video have some idea about what it is so i'm not going to have another additional animation to explain this on the youtube on the web net there are enough number of animations and diagrammatic and even dynamic ways how they've explained Coriolis. Look up any one of them. So here I kind of only sum up that the Coriolis force is number one and hypothetical force. It does not exist. It looks like it exists because there is this Earth's rotation that creates some kind of relative motions. So it's a hypothetical one. Very important point, Coriolis force impacts the direction of the moving wind alone. It does not change the speed of the moving wind. Third, Coriolis force is positively correlated with the speed of the moving body. The faster a body moves, the higher will be its, uh, the, will be the impact of Coriolis deflection. And then, now this is an important one, people miss this out. The Coriolis force always acts perpendicular to the direction of the wind, not the direction of the pressure gradient force. What I mean by this is, if this is the pressure gradient force and if this is the resultant wind because of Coriolis, when you plot Coriolis, you always show Coriolis at 90 degrees to the moving wind. You do not show it 90 degrees from the pressure gradient. This is the pressure gain force. It does not act 90 degrees to the pressure gradient force. It acts 90 to the direction of the moving wind. So you have to remember some of these mechanically for now. And of course you understand. The Coriolis force is zero at the equator because the sine function angle here, it becomes maximum at the poles. So that's Coriolis force. So for now, what I want you to remember is the Coriolis force deflects the winds. And as a rule, the deflection is in the, no, is in the right in the northern hemisphere and on the left in the southern hemisphere. I believe uh, these are more or less known and I am trying to you know, uh, confirm this for you, maybe stress on these facts so that when I teach you can take down the notes and summarize that these three are the forces that act on the winds. Now, to understand the winds at the surface level is relatively easier. We have high pressure, we have low pressure and the wind starts moving and some deflection. But the moment I go to the higher layers, the story becomes a bit different. The phenomena and the mechanism is same, but how the winds manifest, that becomes a bit different. So what I've done is, I've shown the atmosphere as three different layers. Say layer one, or layer one here near the surface, mountains, obstacles, free, uh, friction. So layer one, layer two, and layer three. Layer one, high pressure towards me, and the low pressure is inside the board. So high and low. This also is high. Okay. This is also high and low inside. High and low inside. So in all the layers, the pressure gradient is okay towards the board. And the high pressure is towards me. Okay. So the pressure gradient always acts like this. That's how I've shown. Now what happens is, in the lower layers, because of friction, the wind velocities are less. Okay, that's why I've shown a smaller length of the arrow. Okay, the same thing I'm showing on the vertical plane. P is a pressure gradient force and the wind is not as fast and the Coriolis force at 90 degrees here 
next layer the wind has become faster so i have shown shown it longer and faster wind bigger turning so i have shown the coriolis force at 90 here and when i hit the higher most layer uh, uh, the the highest layers the winds have become very fast and the coriolis force is maximum it has turned entirely such that the pressure gradient seems to be perfectly balancing the Coriolis force. So it's almost like okay, two opposite directions. At the surface level, okay, we have the Coriolis force, we have the pressure gradient force, the wind is smaller and the wind has turned less. But as I go higher up, okay, the wind becomes more stronger and the turning becomes more as i go higher up the wind becomes even more stronger and the turning even more so if you look through the layers okay it looks like the wind has kind of completely turned such that the pressure gradient is now perfectly balanced by coriolis force with the winds moving exactly perpendicular to this plane or this axis. Now we call this type of a wind as geostrophic winds. Okay, so it's a very special case. If you want four or five points of summary, okay, a geostrophic wind, a geostrophic balance is a very special case where because of very high speeds of winds, and why would the speeds be very high? Because they are in the above layers, far away from the friction that the topography might have on the winds. So geostrophic winds or geostrophic balance is a very special case where at higher elevations, very fast moving winds okay, have a condition where the pressure gradient is perfectly balanced by the Coriolis force. And the winds move at right angles to the Coriolis for, uh, to the pressure gradient force. So it's a special case where the winds are no longer moving across isobars. I repeat, a special case where the winds are no longer moving across isobars. They are moving parallel to the isobars. So some of you would know this that this is what creates the upper tropospheric winds okay and everywhere the winds move along the latitudes from west towards east we call them as upper tropospheric westerlies so i have explained something here i can understand at the pace of things you might miss some words but i'll suggest rewind this couple of times and then i'll read out from the textbook but i think at the end of maybe 20 minutes of Okay, uh, jottings, you'll understand what this balance means. So a very special case called as geostrophic balance. And the winds are called as geostrophic winds. Now, the same geostrophic balance can also operate for winds which are okay, uh, rotatory in motions. These are the circular winds, something like the cyclones and the anticyclones. Okay, so uh, let me explain this a bit differently. I hope you have understood the geostrophic balance. You may always rewind the video, pause the video, draw the diagrams again. Okay, until you draw and jot down what we teach here, okay, you will not be able to understand or recall much of it. Okay, so what I said is, said is a special case called as geostrophic condition what happens in this the pressure gradient force which is the force because of difference of high and low pressure this pressure gain force is perfectly balanced by the Coriolis force so I've, in the diagram I've shown that if this is the pressure gradient force the Coriolis will be exactly opposite and of equal length and the wind will move like this so if this is the pressure gain force, Coriolis, the wind moves perpendicular. 
okay now the same principle applies to even rotatory winds okay like cyclones and anti cyclones now the rule is when do we have cyclones cyclones is when the central core has a low pressure so if i have a low pressure around the low pressure there are progressive high pressure isobars so if this is low this is relatively high the direction of the pressure gradient will always be directed from high towards the low okay and in balance the coriolis will always be directed outwards this is the rule if the pgf is in one direction the coriolis will be exactly opposite if i have geostrophic balance so i'm talking about a geostrophic balance under a very unique condition geostrophic balance when i have got circulatory motions by the way in the northern hemisphere the low pressure system cyclones have counter clockwise rotation so the wind is moving something like this so from high towards low is the direction of the pressure gradient the coriolis is exactly opposite okay and if it is rotating like this you will always have okay centripetal forces and the centripetal force is always directed inwards so what i have is if i show the vector diagram i have a pressure gradient force i have a coriolis force i have centripetal force pressure gradient centripetal coriolis and in this the centripetal force is actually weakening the coriolis force if this would have the was the coriolis force because of centripetal which is pulling it down this force gets relatively weakened and this condition is called as subgeostrophic conditions and that's what i write in a cyclone in a low pressure where the centripetal weakens coriolis this is a case of subgeostrophic conditions and the reverse if it's an anti cyclone with a high pressure at center and the low pressure is outward now in this how is the how is the pressure gradient force the pressure gradient force always from high towards the low the coriolis will always be directed in the opposite direction the centripetal will always be inward okay centripetal in either case there is centrifugal that throws the body out there is centripetal that pulls the body in so in both cases you will have a centripetal force and in both cases it is directly inwards what's changing is the direction of pgf and the coriolis so if i draw a vector for this i have the pgf like this coriolis like this and i have centripetal here now in this case the centripetal is strengthening the coriolis in this case the centripetal is counter to coriolis okay so weakening coriolis sub geostrophic in this case the centripetal is strengthening the coriolis okay so we call this as super geostrophic so in anti cyclones which have high pressure cores the centripetal strengthens the coriolis force and this condition is called as super geostrophic winds and both these type of winds are also called as gradient winds so that's an addition for some of you maybe most of us know about regular winds you know a bit more you might know about geostrophic winds and the upper tropospheric winds and i have drawn a diagram for that this is the next level 
where the geostrophic condition is now being discussed for circulatory and rotatory winds and uh, we call these circulatory winds as gradient winds there's a name that we have and uh, there are two types of gradient winds the low pressure ones where the centripetal weakens the Coriolis it's called as subgeostrophic the high pressure systems where the centripetal uh, strengthens the Coriolis it's called as the super geostrophic winds so that's more or less the concept now if we were to look up some pages okay again Savindra Singh Geo, uh, climatology okay I, I am a stickler for textbooks I would like you to look up some books and not mechanically refer to notes alone it's impossible notes of any institute or any teacher will suffice particularly now with the kind of width that they are asking maybe six seven ten years ago it was relatively easier that way okay so please do have textbooks now for discussions you may look up uh, page number 84 okay this is climatology by Savindra Singh this is chapter number five atmospheric pressure and motion so you can pause the video go and get your textbook and read along with me so page 84 atmospheric motions so it talks about the forces the first one is pressure gradient and air circulation so it says the difference of pressure between two places is called as pressure gradient since pressure is inversely related to temperature differences in pressure are thus the result of differences in the heating and cooling of land and water surfaces anyway this is still too simple why because we can have pressure which are not always related to heating or warming conditions okay so fine this is one case it's okay at this level and then he says uh, you may look up the um, central part of this column it says the pressure gradient is also called as barometric slope okay and it says there's a clo very close relationship between the pressure gradient and the atmospheric motion in terms of speed and direction as per rule air moves down the pressure gradient from high to low that's the rule everywhere i had the diagram earlier always from high towards low and this rule is also obeyed for the vertical movement movement it's just that some of you end up comparing different layers okay in terms of pressure so if you look at the next page page 85 first column the first paragraph okay first line it may be pointed out that force generated by pressure gradient is called pressure gradient force so some diagrams here you may look up the next page page number 86 and look at the first line it says now this is about why despite a difference of pressure in the vertical direction we do not have winds under normal circumstances why because when the upward pressure gradient force is balanced by downward acting gravity force okay the vertical acceleration becomes zero and this is the balance called as the hydrostatic equilibrium so you can look this up the same page Coriolis force so there are okay a, a list of points seven of them here which says the Coriolis force is not a force in itself it's hypothetical that it becomes effective when body starts moving that it affects direction not the speed but it depends on the speed the Coriolis force cannot slow down a wind or make the wind faster but the force itself depends on whether the wind is fast or not fast more the speed higher is the Coriolis force and therefore sharper is the deflection it says it becomes maximum at the poles due to okay minimum rotation and minimum at the equator there's a sine angle to it and this was important point number six it always acts at right angles to the horizontal moving air and other moving objects so it is never at right angles to the pressure gain force it's always at right angles to the moving winds and the rule that we have is towards right in the northern hemisphere and towards left in the southern hemisphere you can look this up 
Then page number 87, we have something on friction. So no big deal. You can read that on your own. Now come towards page 89. It says, geostrophic wind. The wind blowing above the ground or the water surfaces generally between altitudes of 500, 1000 meters are parallel to the isobars and at a right angle to the pressure gain force. So as we go high up, Okay, I've shown the diagram earlier, you can rewind and check up. The winds are no longer moving along the gradient force. The winds are no longer along the gradient. They are moving perpendicular gradient. And we call this as the geostrophic condition. So you can read this paragraph here. And the next page, page number 90, you do have a nice diagram. Okay, so you have got three sketches depicting the vector diagrams. Okay, and the dotted line is the wind. The length of the wind is increasing, the dotted line increases and you can see the length of the Coriolis force okay, also is changing and is now becoming opposite to the pressure gain force. So at uh, above 1000 uh, millibar level, okay, we have a pressure, okay, uh, we have a condition called as geostrophic. I have drawn this diagram here, it is what it depicts in the diagram. Now. Uh, the concept called gradient wind, page 90, it says gradient wind is in fact a variant of geostrophic wind and blows along a curved or a circular path okay. parallel to the curved or the circular isobars. If the geostrophic wind is a result of balance between okay, uh, pressure gradient force and Coriolis force, the gradient winds are the result of pressure gradient force, Coriolis force and centrifugal centripetal force. So in these winds, we have additional forces, not simply the Coriolis and the pressure gradient force. So uh, some discussions here. Now I will suggest if you want to look up a bit more for understanding, uh, the better book for reference is Made Simple Part 1. Now, this is another book okay, by Richard Bryant. A uh, very popular book that we have in geography and I'll suggest that some of the concepts and depictions are very brilliant here. Okay, so you can look up page number 140, 141, made simple part 1 series which is physical geography page 140, 141. So 140 under the centripetal force, look at the okay, uh, uh, last section of page 140, it says uh, the last line of the last but one paragraph, it says wind which is in balance with these three forces. The three forces are centripetal and you have got Coriolis and you have got pressure gain force. It's called as the gradient wind. And then it says, next paragraph it says, okay, and in reference to diagram it says, motions around a low pressure area, which is a low pressure system which is anti-clockwise in the northern hemisphere is, is termed cyclonic and in this case the result of centripetal effect is to make Coriolis force weaker okay and the wind is called as subgeostrophic wind the anti-cyclonic flow which is the other one in the high pressure case okay is clockwise and is called as super geostrophic since the Coriolis force exceeds or the centripetal makes the Coriolis force stronger. So it exceeds the pressure gradient force. So these are the references okay, for this reading. Some of you could try this. Uh, last year, uh, or it was uh, 2017, sorry. We had a question in climatology on this, optional geography. It says, discuss the forces which govern the air movement on the earth's surface. Discuss the forces that govern the air movement on the earth's surface. So please look this up and I'm sure it will help you. And happy reading and happy answer writing. Thank you.